So today I want to build on the topics that we've been talking about lately, uh, specifically things like plate tectonics and also locations of volcanic eruptions and kind of keep that theme going and today talk specifically about earthquakes. So we'll talk a little bit at first about what is an earthquake and what triggers earthquakes. Then we'll also talk to where you can find them specifically at both um, active plate boundaries and sometimes oddly enough you can get them even in the middle of plates on passive margins um, and then we'll also talk to about different types of hazards associated with earthquakes and are there ways that we can predict that there's an impending earthquake and therefore be able to prepare a little bit um, i just happened to go on the u.s geologic survey website uh, recently and i grabbed this image here kind of shows you um, not only in red the plate boundaries but then the little orange dots of course are showing you where there have been recent earthquakes and the size of the dot shows you how big the earthquake is so the, the magnitude there so you can kind of see that a lot of times they do uh, tend to cluster along plate boundaries, but we also do rarely have them in the middle of plates. And oddly enough, right now, one of the places that is getting a lot of earthquake activity that is nowhere near a plate boundary is uh, Oklahoma. And I'll show you in a few minutes uh, why we're having such a big problem with um, abundant, relatively small earthquakes in a place that should be relatively tectonically quiet. So, okay, so what happens in an earthquake? The idea here is that um, it, it, when rocks are in the subsurface, uh, they're not always just going to be uh, at rest and they're not always just going to, to be passive. There will be times where they will be put under stress. And so stress is just essentially the application of a force, right? So if you can imagine that rocks at depth are kind of feeling directed pressure not only from the stuff that's on top of them pushing down, but sometimes, especially along plate boundaries where rocks are trying to move, they can start to feel stress from an exerted force. Now, stress can be applied to rocks to where they kind of bend a little bit. And so you can see in this image here, you can imagine you know, if you had a stick and you kind of just gently exerted a little bit of stress onto the stick, you could get it to bend, um, but if you stopped exerting pressure on that stick before the stick broke, it would probably go back to normal, right? And it would kind of, you know, bend and then kind of flex back into being straight as long as you didn't break it. And rocks can do the same thing. Uh, you can imagine that if you did apply a stress, you know, to rocks like this, that rocks would initially at least maybe start to bend a little bit. In other words, they stick together, they, they hold their coherence, and they're able to behave a little bit plastically, at least up front. However, if we keep applying stress, so we keep applying continued stress to those rocks, what will eventually happen, just like if you kept exerting uh, stress on that stick, you would eventually break it in half and there would be right energy released once the stick actually broke. The same thing would happen with the rocks, right? Eventually you would get movement or you would get a break along the two pieces of rock that are trying to, to move past each other. And as those two pieces of rock finally do break and move, um, you get the same type of energy released that you did when you would have uh, broken your, your stick. So there is a slip component, right? That's the actual breaking and movement of the rock um, that happens during the actual earthquake. So a lot of um, geologists will actually call this like the stick slip cycle. And what they're meaning is they're not talking about the stick here as in like this piece of wood. They're talking about stick as in the rock sticking together, right? Holding together under low stress conditions. And it can kind of hang on and um, stick together for a little while. But eventually what happens is as the pressure and pressure increases more and more, the rock will break and slip. And this is when you actually generate your earthquake here. So the stick slip cycle. It's the same idea here, right? You can imagine that if you have a block uh, or a weight, right, sitting here and it's attached to a spring, that you could actually kind of, you know, move your hand back this way. You could elongate the spring and to some point, right, 
you would actually see that this block would still stick to the block beneath it. It hasn't actually moved yet, even though you've exerted um, stress on the spring. So we're building up stress, right, as we pull the spring, and only eventually when we overcome, right, the actual friction that's right between here, will this block actually start to move. The spring will then kind of contract. You get the slip, right, the actual rock starts to move from where it was once connected, and this is where you would actually have the earthquake forming right here. Once again, that stress could then build up, right? You could then kind of pull the spring a little bit more, a little bit more, nothing's moving, nothing's moving, until then finally this moves again, you get slip and another earthquake. So here's the stick slips uh, cycle, and a more sophisticated way of describing this that they usually do in textbooks is something called elastic rebound theory. Elastic, okay, that's the part here where you can kind of squeeze um, the, the, you can kind of pull the spring open a little bit, right? You still have some elastic behavior during the stick phase of the, um, of the earthquake cycle. And if you actually let go of the spring in this phase right here, that spring would go back, right, to the same level it was up here the rock wouldn't be deformed and the spring wouldn't be deformed. In fact, it would elastically rebound and be the same as it was in the previous cycle here during the stick phase. But once you get into the slip phase, once you actually move the block, right, you kind of can't go back because the block has already broken and started to move. So elastic rebound theory is just another fancy way of talking about this stick slip cycle that we tend to see in earthquakes. So where do earthquakes occur? Now, if we're thinking of a big picture, you know, where do earthquakes occur globally? Many times what we would see is a map of the earth and that earthquakes tend to cluster along plate boundaries. Plate boundaries are very large, very long uh, regional areas where rocks are sliding past each other. More locally, though, where uh, rocks break and tend to move past each other, they don't have to be on big, huge plate boundaries. They can happen along much more um, uh, localized or smaller features that we call faults. So if you happen to have taken a, uh, another intro geology course, you might have talked about faults. A fault essentially is just a fancy word for a plane along which rocks move. Okay, so it's a, a planar surface along which rocks are going to move. And there's a bunch of different types of faults, uh, and I will introduce them here. Um, but just know that this is just a place where rocks are sliding past each other. And in that sliding past each other, the rocks, of course, are going to um, kind of get caught along each other. Stress will build up, and potentially once we release that stress, we can create earthquakes. So, okay, there are a couple of different types of faults, and we'll talk about the, uh, the three that are shown right here. Uh, the first one over here on the left, this is called a reverse fault. So this is the fault plane right in here. Okay, so this would be the fault plane right in here, and I can't really draw 3D very well, but this essentially is the fault along which these two blocks of rock are going to move. How do you know which block moves and which one doesn't? Let me show you a, a really neat trick. The way I teach my students about faults is find the fault plane, right? Find the plane along which rocks are going to move. And I want you to draw a stick person so that the belly button of the stick person is across the fault. Okay, good so far? What that does is that says, okay, the head of the stick person will be over here and the foot or the feet of the stick person should be over here. This identifies the block that moves and the block that doesn't move, okay? The hanging wall block, or some people call this the head wall block, either way, the hanging wall block is the one that does the moving. The foot wall block doesn't move, okay? So if we now erase our stick person, we now know, and I'll erase that too, that we have a, ha a hanging wall and a foot wall, now we can figure out what kind of fault we have. If the hanging wall, if the hanging wall moves up with respect to the foot wall, you have a reverse or a thrust fault. Okay, so check this out. 
if we notice that this red group of rocks was once connected to this red group of rocks down here, does it make sense that this block moved up and this block looks like, even though the foot wall block doesn't move, it looks like that block is moving down. Does that make sense? So the hanging wall block has moved up with respect to the foot wall rock. So that then tells us that if the hanging wall moved up, we have what's called a reverse or a thrust fault. You see how we've written the word hurt? Perfect. If you can remember the word hurt, it'll tell you hanging wall up, reverse or thrust fault. Okay. A reverse fault is a very uh, high angle um, uh, fault. So a steep fault where the hanging wall moves up. A thrust fault would be if the angle of the fault plane was a lot shallower like this, okay? We don't have to worry about the difference between a reverse or a thrust fault right now, but just remember that if the hanging wall moves up, you have a reverse or a thrust fault. Now, let's do the same thing for our second fault over here. Let's put our stick person, okay? My belly button got slipped down a little bit, but that's okay. Hanging wall, foot wall. Still good here? Is this still correct? Okay, great. Now, if we know that these red rocks were once connected to these red rocks, put your sense of motion arrows now on the fault. Does it look like this guy has moved down and this one has moved up with respect to each other? Okay, great. So now we want to know which block did the moving up. Now remember, this one looks like the up arrow is on the foot wall. So if the foot wall looks like it moves up, now does the foot wall actually move? No, but the up arrow is on the foot wall because the hanging wall block moved down. If it's a foot wall up fault, that means that this is a normal fault. Okay, so foot wall up normal fault. And again, we're not talking necessarily about which block is doing the moving because the foot wall doesn't actually move, but you're looking at which block has the up arrow. Okay, so if you can remember this very strange, but it works, if you can remember fun hurt, that will help you figure out the types of faults when you can see the fault plane in cross section view like this and figure out where the up arrow is. So fun hurt, right? Foot wall up arrow equals normal. If the hanging wall has the up arrow, it's a reverse or a thrust fault. So it's pretty cool, easy way to remember those. Those are for our first two types of faults, right? Our last type of fault though, that's over here, this is where we have a strike slip fault. Now notice the fault in a strike slip fault is vertical. Okay, so neither block is going to have an up or a down arrow. And so that's why this one's kind of different from the whole fun hurt idea. Strike slip faults don't occur when a block is a hanging wall or a foot wall block moving up or down. Instead, your blocks are going to be moving side to side, right? They're just kind of rubbing past each other. So neither block is the hanging wall, neither block is the foot wall, but we can name a strike slip fault by the direction of which the other side of the block moves. Here's how you do it. Let's make sure, let's put ourselves over here. Okay, let's make ourselves a happy little geologist. We're gonna be right here. If we stand on this side of the fault and we look across to the block that is on the other side of the fault, does it make sense that it looks like this block has moved to the right? Okay, with respect to us, this block has moved to the right. Does that make sense? So that means this is a right lateral strike slip fault, okay? And it doesn't matter what side of the fault you're on because look, I can erase all this. I can put us over here. And if we look across the fault here, it looks like this block has moved with respect to us here to the right. So it's still a right lateral strike slip fault. Neat, right? So we can figure out now all the different types of faults that are uh, that are out there, remembering though that the um, the earthquakes that we're going to be talking about are usually going to occur because rocks move along faults, and as they're moving, they're going to um, release stress, and it's that stress release that gives us the earthquake. So a couple of different terms that you may or may not have heard yet about um, earthquakes. A lot of times when they report earthquakes, 
they tell you about the epicenter, right? The epicenter was, you know, just uh, three miles south of San Francisco or something like that. So um, the they don't often report, unless they're geologists, they don't often report the focus, but they are actually related, the focus and the epicenter. And let me show you how. The focus of an earthquake is where at depth on the fault plane the actual uh, movement or slip started. Okay, so where the energy began to be released. So the focus is usually here, I'll put down here, the focus is at depth, right? That's, you know, six kilometers down or something like that. The focus is the, the zone along the fault plane where the rocks start to move and the energy is being generated. It's not very helpful though to tell the general public, oh, the focus was seven kilometers below San Francisco that doesn't really mean a whole lot. So instead, what we do is we talk about the epicenter. The epicenter is if you take the focus and you come directly straight up to the surface, right? The epicenter is the point on the surface that is directly above the focus. And so the epicenter here is at the surface. And that's why you can imagine that a lot of times we'll say, uh, oh, the epicenter was, you know, at Knoxville or whatever, Tennessee. That's where you can actually report it on the news, you know, where the actual epicenter was located. So this is not, the epicenter is not where the actual movement started at depth. It just is giving us a location at the surface above the earthquake's focus. Many times when an earthquake moves, um, especially if it's a large earthquake, we will see that there are um, evidence at the Earth's surface that shows which block did the moving. Remember, you know, here's, a, here's our fault right here, and we can do our stick person here, and that this is the foot wall, and this is the hanging wall, and so we can see here this is a foot wall up normal fault. Um, but a lot of times, right, we're not actually going to be able to see this side of the block. So instead, what we're going to see at the Earth's surface after an earthquake is something called a surface rupture. So this block, right, slid down this way and then exposed part of the foot wall block here. And that's what we call the surface rupture. Because we can't see right at inside the Earth to see this side, we could figure out that if we see this surface rupture, this was the foot wall, this was the hanging wall, and that this was a normal fault movement. So here is uh, you know, a, a distribution map showing the earthquake locations that are in red. Once again, you'll notice that they seem to mainly cluster along plate boundaries. Although there are some, of course, right? There's some that sit way out here, some that are in passive margins, right? Um, and some that will be in the middle parts of continents. The yellow dots, of course, are showing you um, cities with very large populations. So there are a lot of cities that tend to be, notice look over here in, in Japan and in, in Asia, lots of cities that happen to be located very close to places that get large and um, large numbers as well as large magnitude earthquakes. So they do tend to cluster along plate boundaries, but not always. We can find a bunch of earthquakes that will be uh, on passive margins or in the interior parts of continents. So where do we actually get a lot of earthquakes? Well, mainly they're gonna be along plate boundaries. Do they tend to be at one type of plate boundary more so than the other? Well, not really. Uh, if you go back to that slide previously, you'll see that we do tend to get earthquakes along all major plate boundary types. So if you think back to our discussion of plate tectonics, we talked about divergent plate boundaries, right? Remember, divergent plate boundaries are where plates are pulling apart like this. So you could get things like mid-ocean ridges, or you could get rift zones. In those uh, divergent plate boundary areas, usually you get very shallow earthquakes. Right. Remember that we said at mid-ocean ridges, you've got lots of hot molten material very close to the surface. And so as those plates are pulling apart, the stuff that's pulling apart is extremely warm. So the warmer things are, usually the more, um, the more plastic or the more elastic they behave. Earthquakes tend to form where you have mainly brittle um, deformation. And so you need kind of uh, cold uh, temperatures and fast movements.
So divergent plate boundaries, mid-ocean ridges and rifts tend to have shallow earthquakes. Transform plate boundaries, you remember, are where rocks are going to be moving past each other, very similar to the San Andreas Fault in California. And you'll have a vertical fault plane and you'll get shallow earthquakes, but you might also get intermediate depth earthquakes. Um, and the reason for that is because those faults at uh, transform plate boundaries, those strike slip faults that tend to form there can still be pretty deep down, several kilometers, you know, 10 kilometers or more. Um, so those are still gonna be um, shallow to intermediate earthquakes, but we're not gonna get really, really deep earthquakes because uh, transform plate boundaries are not gonna go as deep as, you know, say 100 kilometers or more. Now, last but not least, remember our last plate boundary type was a convergent plate boundary. That's where we've got plates coming together like this, right? In a convergent plate boundary zone, you get a wide range of earthquake types. They can be shallow earthquakes, intermediate, or very, very deep earthquakes. And the reason for that, when plates come together, right, if you've got subduction, and here's my overriding plate. If you have subduction coming down here, you're gonna essentially be forming earthquakes all along this subducting plate as the slab goes underneath the overriding plate here. And if you remember from last week's discussions, we talked about kind of how we know what we think we know about the Earth's uh, interior. And we talked about the Wadati zone, right? The Wadati Benioff zone. The Wadati zone is this zone of earthquakes that shows the subducting slab going down here. So at convergent plate boundaries, we get a very broad zone of earthquakes that we call the Wadati zone that tells us that yes, as that subducting slab is moving underneath the overriding plate, as it's slipping and sliding and grinding across the plate that's overriding it, each, uh, each time it moves, it's gonna give off energy and create earthquakes. So let's look at um, some types of plate boundary earthquakes. Now the San Andreas Fault um, runs through California, right? So you can kind of, if I do it like this, right? There's the San Andreas Fault running through California. This was a very, um, a very devastating earthquake in um, 1994. This was the Northridge earthquake. And I'll show you in a minute what these magnitudes mean, but it was a 6.7 magnitude. Um, and it resulted from movement along the San Andreas Fault out here. And this map I'm showing you on the left is, is a, what we call an intensity map. Notice how the color scheme down here, right? The colors are related to how the earthquake was felt. So this was a 6.7 magnitude, and I'll show you the magnitude uh, scale in a second. But notice that the people who felt this earthquake were reporting that it was extremely, extremely large. Lots of violent uh, shaking to extreme shaking and very heavy to heavy damage in a large area around the North Ridge, which was the epicenter right here. So this was a very serious earthquake, 6.7, and people were easily reporting, you know, nines and tens on the intensity scale. That was a uh, transform um, boundary earthquake. Here's the, oh, I don't, forgot, I keep forgetting how to erase these. There you go. So here's some of the stuff that, here's some of the damage that happened during that Northridge earthquake. Uh, so much shaking. You can see that the buildings have absolutely collapsed down here. Roadways have collapsed. And this is actually a, a gas main break that has actually ignited um, due to the um, electricity associated with the down power lines over here. So really devastating um, uh, 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 fallout from the uh, Northridge earthquake in 1994. So that was a transform uh, boundary earthquake. And so very heavy damage, even associated with just kind of an intermediate depth earthquake there. Um, here's our, uh, our mid-ocean ridge idea here is this, this is a mid-ocean ridge earthquake. They should be relatively shallow, right? Because it's essentially just the cold rock that's up at the surface as it starts to cool and move away from our mid-ocean ridges there. Um, and of course, then my drawing was not nearly as pretty as this one over here, right? Here's our convergent plate boundaries with our downgoing slab coming this way. And then these would be those earthquakes uh, popping off as the um, ocean crust is subducting. The depth to which these earthquakes continue is about 700 kilometers. 
So these can be really deep at convergent zones and notice how they're kind of just uh, shallow to intermediate at these um, divergent and transform boundaries, kind of different. Oh, look, there I did. I, I wondered if I could remember to put in the, the Benioff zone. But here again, notice there's your 700 kilometers depth. That's where the earthquakes tend to stop during a um, convergent uh, subduction zone there. And remember, here's a pop quiz question, right? Why do you not get earthquakes below about 700 kilometers deep? What do we need in order for earthquakes to form, right? You need to have brittle brittle deformation because you need to have breaking right so stuff needs to break and what are the what are the conditions underneath we can actually make things break usually it's under cold conditions and fast movement the problem is is that as you get deeper and deeper and deeper right things down here are going to get very warm and very fluid or very plastic and so in order to get earthquakes if we want earthquakes to form we need brittle cold conditions and the deeper you go in the earth, of course, things get too warm and too fluid. And so about 700 kilometers depth is, uh, is the, the, the farthest down we have been able to record earthquakes. So, okay, take home message, earthquakes tend to form mostly at plate boundaries. Does that mean that they never form in the middle of plates? Of course not. We do have what are called intra-plate, right, intra-plate earthquakes. That means in the middle of plates. If we look at North America, uh, we know that the red here is the um, nearest plate boundary. So it's cutting through California there, right, and going through the Caribbean. Um, but there is a very large, you cannot see that green, let's do the red. There's a very large uh, earthquake zone in the middle of the country. And it's very strange because it is extremely far away from any sort of plate boundary. Um, if you look at the uh, image over here on the right, here's the activity since 1974. And look, here's Tennessee, Arkansas, Missouri, and Kentucky up here. There is this huge seismic zone. It's called the New Madrid Seismic Zone. And it's in eastern Missouri. And it seems to be right along the Mississippi River Valley right through here, right? And all these little plus marks are earthquakes. There have been some major earthquakes associated with the New Madrid seismic zone. In fact, in December of uh, 1811, there was a magnitude 7.5 earthquake in the New Madrid seismic zone that people in New England said that they actually felt. So you can imagine the distance associated between Boston and Missouri, and they were actually still feeling that earthquake. So why do we get really big earthquakes in the middle of plates, right? We were just saying that usually you have to have fault movement and, um, and plate boundaries in order to get the stress buildup associated with creating earthquakes. Well, let me just see if I can do this here. Uh, right through this region here, right, this is the Mississippi River Valley. And the Mississippi River is draining, right, the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River and whatever else. That used to be a very, very old region where North America tried to rift apart, right? It tried to separate. And so there is a bunch of faults underneath the Mississippi River. And so it is a zone that tends to like to move. So even though there's no plate boundary there right now, way back in geologic history, North American continent tried to split apart and there are the faults left over from that attempted rift and it's those faults that keep moving to create the New Madrid seismic zone. So kind of a great example there too as to uh, why it's important to know Earth history, right? We have to know why that zone tends to have earthquakes in it, and it's because it has historically been uh, an old plate boundary, but it's not anymore. So here's the uh, intensity map of that uh, New Madrid earthquake from 1811. And you'll notice that the little yellow dot right here in the middle, right, that's the epicenter of the earthquake. And this is what's showing you, too, is that even way up here in Boston and Canada, they were still able to feel that earthquake. So can we get big earthquakes in the middle of plates? Absolutely. They don't always have to be on plate boundaries. 
and some of them can be quite devastating. In fact, we've even had some in uh, in Charleston um, down here. We've had some relatively large earthquakes, and again, that's on a passive margin. So um, the energy released from earthquakes uh, creates waves, and a, and a really great way to imagine this is if you uh, take a pebble and throw it into a pond, the waves from that pebble kind of generate outwards in all directions, right? That's the same idea as whenever an a earthquake occurs, we create energy waves and we send those energy waves out in all directions. Now there's a couple of different types of waves that are generated whenever we have an earthquake. So let's deal with these two first. There's P waves and S waves. P waves are compressional waves, okay? So think of the P as compression or the other, the reason why it's called a P wave, these are what we call primary, right? These are our primary waves. And so you can imagine if you had a slinky, you guys remember what slinkies are, right? If you had a slinky and you held it in both hands and put it uh, just uh, across your desk, and you kind of, you know, just pushed the one side, pushed one side in like this, you would get parts that would constrict and parts that would stretch and parts that would constrict. And it would kind of, you know, accordion out like that. Those are compression waves that you're making. And that is creating uh, primary waves or P waves. So you see here it's showing zones of extension and zones of compression. Uh, we can create P waves when we have earthquakes as well. So the primary part tells us that uh, P waves are actually the fastest. Okay, these are generated um, during the earthquake and they are the fastest moving type of waves because they are compression waves. The second type of wave that we have are S waves. Okay, S waves are either called secondary or shear waves. Now they are uh, kind of, they're slower than the P waves and instead of our slinky now kind of uh, extending and compressing, imagine that you kind of like, you know, uh, move the slinky side to side. So you kind of have this, this snaking back and forth, right? This shear wave idea, this kind of back and forthing um, of your wave that creates an S wave. So S waves are shear waves, right? They move slower than the P wave, but they're gonna be faster than our third class of waves, which is going to be the surface waves. Now hang on to surface waves for a second. The cool thing about, let me go back up here real quick. The cool thing about these waves, okay? P waves are the fastest and they go through all types of um, materials in the subsurface. They can go through both solids and liquids. Okay. S waves, however, can only go through solids. If you think of it, it's really difficult to shear a liquid. So these can only go through, if I could spell solid better, it'd be great. These can only go through solids. Okay. So those are primary waves and secondary waves, compression and shear waves. When an earthquake is uh, generated, the P waves and the S waves are the ones that are going to travel through the earth, um, radiating out in all directions from the epicenter. Now, there are also waves that are moving along the earth's surface, and so we aptly name those surface waves. I'm not worried so much if you remember that they're called Rayleigh and Love waves. There are two different types, right? Here's the Here's the love wave, here's the um, shear wave version, and here's a kind of a rolling, the Rayleigh waves are rolling waves. But the um, surface waves are now of the three types of waves, these are the slowest. Okay, these are the slowest types of waves, but because they move at the Earth's surface, they cause most of the damage associated with earthquakes. So if we can imagine like here's a planet, right? And we have an earthquake generated here. It's the P waves and the S waves that are gonna go down into the surface, excuse me, down into the subsurface. And it's the S waves that are gonna travel, the surface waves that are gonna travel up here as the slowest ones. So you can imagine that's why the surface waves are gonna cause the most damage. Oh, I love it when I try to draw um, diagrams and then on my next slide, I've got a much better drawing.
So here's the same idea, right? If this is going to be our earthquake, boom, there's our earthquake generating its waves right there. We're radiating them out in all directions. Here's the P wave and the S wave going through the subsurface. Notice the P wave moves the fastest. And so up here, we've drawn the P wave as our nice little sports car. The S wave moves the second fastest, all right? So that's our little kind of Cadillac or something like that. And then last but not least, our slowest one is the one that has to take the longest route, and that's the one that's at the surface, and so that's our little station wagon. You guys don't have to worry necessarily about you know, how fast these things actually move, but I did want to show you those numbers just in case so that you can see just how much faster P waves are moving from S waves and from surface waves. The reason why this is kind of important is because we can measure through something called a seismograph, we can measure the energy released from an earthquake. And we don't even have to be very near to the earthquake to record that. Uh, if anybody has a, um, I think if you have a Mac laptop or a Mac um, tablet, you can download an app called, uh, I think it's called SizeMac. Um, uh, or max size, one of the two, and it te technically uses the drop sensor in your laptop or your uh, tablet, and you can make it essentially a seismograph. Um, if you then put, if you download SizeMac and then you put your tablet on a desk and you start pounding on the desk, right? You're actually generating waves, energy waves. You'll see that you actually can start to record the um, the shaking of your laptop or your tablet through that app. Um, a seismograph essentially is the same thing. A seismograph is just um, recording whether it feels vibration in the subsurface due to the passing of energy waves. What a seismograph is, generally speaking, is just a pen, right? That's actually just kind of um, a pen is, is, is recording on a rolling drum of paper. And if the pen doesn't feel anything, uh, any sort of waves coming by, right, it's just going to record a solid straight line, kind of like an EKG. But if there's waves and energy disrupting the surface, the pen will start to shake. And then when the shaking stops, it'll go back to normal and like that. So if this is an example here, if this is a seismograph over here on the right, what we'll notice is that every time an earthquake is recorded by a seismograph, the first wave that should be reported is the shaking from the P wave. Now, why is that? Well, because remember the P wave moves the fastest. So if there is an earthquake generated way over here and we're recording at seism seismograph station over here, what's the first wave that should arrive? The P wave. So the P wave will generate first, right? It will arrive at the seismograph station first. And so that's the first one that we should record. The second set of waves that should arrive are the S waves, the shear waves, right? That are coming through the planet from the earthquake. And last but not least, slowest coming in last should be the surface waves. But remember the surface waves cause the most damage, right? So notice that the actual surface waves cause a lot more shaking than those little P and S waves that came in earlier. So we're gonna practice with seismographs uh, in lab, but I just kind of wanted to introduce the concept here so that when we get into lab, it makes a little bit more sense. Here's this idea of a, um, a seismograph. This would be a, a weight with a pen and so the pen is actually now just recording. This is a drum that's rotating, right? So this is paper and a drum. Uh, and of course, it's all done digitally now, but the same concept um, works. Uh, when the ground surface starts to vibrate, when the ground surface moves, you can imagine that if the ground moves down, right, the pen is going to record uh, a movement on the, on the drum. And then when the actual ground surface uh, moves back up, you'll actually see that the pen now starts to draw down on the piece of paper. And again, this is old school, right? This is all done digitally now, but you can see that as the pen records any sort of shaking like this, it's because the ground surface was actually moving with the arrival of either P, S, or surface waves. So here's a, an, an example again of our, um, our, our individual uh, seismic line. Here's the arrival of the P waves, right? This is actually no movement over here. This is just background noise. There's the arrival of the P wave. 
here's the arrival of the secondary or shear wave. And then way over here, right here is the shaking associated with the arrival of the surface waves. The cool thing about using seismographs like this is that we can actually figure out how far we are away from an earthquake if we can figure out something called the SP interval. So what's the time difference between when the P wave arrives and when the S wave arrives? And so here on this seismograph, it's about 50 seconds. But if we can figure out that the, um, the interval, the SP interval, is, um, is very long, of course, we're far away from the earthquake, and the shorter the SP interval is, the closer you are to the earthquake's epicenter. So we'll do this in lab, but the idea here is that if you're really close to an earthquake, right? So if you are really close to an earthquake, let's say station one right here, as the P and the S waves start to travel, right? If the P and the S waves only, uh, only travel, only arrive maybe a couple of seconds different from each other, that means you're really close to the, um, the epicenter of the earthquake. But if you're really far away, the time difference for the arrival of the P wave and then the slower S wave should be much greater. So we're going to play with this in lab um, and you can actually use a graph like the one shown here. If you plot the SP interval, right, this is the travel time of the S wave. This is the travel time of the P wave. If you can figure out the SP interval, you can actually then figure out how far you are away from the epicenter. And so if you're, you know, measuring at your station here in New York City uh, and you've got another couple of seismic stations elsewhere in the world, you can actually triangulate and then find the epicenter of any earthquake. It's kind of fun. So we'll play with this in lab and show you how this is done. Okay, so I've been using some terms um, throughout the, the lesson today, like magnitude versus intensity. Um, and I think it's probably important that we um, define these before we use them anymore, especially when we talk about volcanic, ha uh, volcanic um, earthquake hazards. So let's define intensity and magnitude before we go any further. The intensity of an earthquake is how it feels, okay? And that is measured on something called the modified Mercalli scale. Um, the intensity of an earthquake is pretty subjective. Um, if I um, asked all 26 of you to describe, um, you know, how loud it is when I clap my hands, it probably would be very different for each of you, right? Some of you might say it's loud. Some of you might say it's not that loud. And so an earthquake intensity is subjective. It's how does the earthquake feel? A magnitude, however, is different because it is a definable how much energy is released. It is measured on the Richter scale, which is usually right logarithmic. So every uh, increase in one Richter unit means an increase of 10 times. So it's a log scale. Here's an important take home message about intensity and magnitude. An earthquake can only have one magnitude, but that same earthquake can have multiple, right, many intensities. A magnitude of an earthquake, right, how much energy is released, there should only be one value. But depending on how close or how far you are away from that earthquake, right, that's how it's going to feel. So you can have many different intensities for the same earthquake, but it should only have one actual magnitude. So we'll look in lab as well how you can figure out how you can actually calculate the magnitude of an earthquake and, and we can do it using our, um, our seismogram here. We can figure out the SP interval to figure out how far we are away from the earthquake, right? We can plot that here. And then we can also plot the amplitude of shaking from the surface waves. So if that's say 23 millimeters, we could plot 23 millimeters over here. And if you connect those dots right there, you'd see that this was recorded a magnitude five earthquake on the Richter scale. Every Richter unit, because it's a logarithmic scale, means 10 times greater ground motion. So a, um, a uh, Richter magnitude of one versus a Richter magnitude of two, right? That's a 10 times greater motion um, when you go one Richter unit. 
What you'll notice too is that if on a graph like this, the Richter magnitude is shown here on the left. And this funnel shape in the middle here is supposed to kind of show you the broader the base here, right, is the number of earthquakes of that magnitude. And the skinnier it gets up here means that there are fewer and fewer numbers of those magnitude earthquakes. So what this should tell you is that every year we have a very large number of low magnitude earthquakes. However, right over time, the number of earthquakes per year worldwide gets much, much smaller as you get up into the higher magnitude earthquakes. So it's rare to get very big earthquakes. It is very frequent, however, that we have very small earthquakes. To give you an, uh, an estimation of how much energy is released, here's the energy released in terms of uh, kilograms of explosives. Um, here's some of the earthquakes. Here's that Northridge, California earthquake that I was telling you about right in here. And notice that it kind of comes in just around the same amount of energy released as the um, atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. Um, here's a lightning bolt. Here's an average tornado, um, the Oklahoma City bombing. Notice that many of the big earthquakes that we're going to talk about throughout the rest of today's class. Uh, I'll show you San Francisco. Here's Chile. There's that New Madrid one. Uh, all of them are significantly above, right? Here's the world's largest nuclear test up here. So these are tons and tons of energy released um, during these earthquakes, very strong. The Mercalli scale now, like I said, is a little bit different, right? Instead of quantitative, it is qualitative and it is subjective. So you can see that an intensity of number one says that it's felt by very few people. Um, an intensity of two and three, mm, just a couple people might be feeling it. Maybe an object starts to swing. And so we define these categories one through 12. Um, but again, it's kind of subjective and you'll see in lab next week, we're gonna uh, work with this a little bit to see uh, based on the descriptions that you, that you read about an earthquake, would you pick a, a six or would you pick a nine or something like that for the um, intensity of that earthquake? So, okay, true or false, an earthquake can have a, um, can have multiple intensities. Okay, true, right? Because multiple intensities, because remember it is subjective, right? It's qualitative. True or false, an earthquake can have more than one magnitude. Okay, that's definitely false because remember an earthquake can only have one amount of energy released. Good. Um, we're at about, um, let's see, almost 50 minutes in. So if you wanted to kind of take a break, this would be a good place to maybe take a break and you can come back. Uh, and if not, um, I'll just keep talking here and you guys can keep going, but this would be a good place if you wanted to just go take a, a couple minute break and walk around and then come back and maybe we'll finish the lesson here. Okay. So now we want to talk a little bit too about how sometimes earthquakes really can cause uh, different types of damage based on what types of sediments those earthquakes go through. Um, when you have shaking of solid rock like this over here, notice that if this is kind of the amplitude of the shaking, the, the shaking is not going to be all that bad, right? The, the solid rock underneath you is a strong foundation and it doesn't vibrate very much. So sending waves through a solid bedrock doesn't really um, amplify those waves very much and so the shaking will be um, kind of minimal. Notice though how as you go through the different types of now solid igneous rock to sedimentary rock and these things over here alluvium and silt and mud these are not rock now this is kind of loose sediment and dirt. The looser and uh, less cemented the sediment is when those waves come through it boy it really can amplify the shaking. So um, cities that are built on hard, solid bedrock usually don't have to worry so much about uh, earthquake uh, waves being ampli amplified by the subsurface. But if you do have cities that are built on top of um, loose sediment, if there are earthquakes prone to that area, the uh, energy from the waves can actually be amplified, can actually be augmented 
by the sediment beneath them and the earthquake shaking can be a lot worse. Uh, Mexico City is a great example of this, actually, that um, Mexico City, if you look at the cross section here, Mexico City sits on top of uh, ancient lake deposits. That's the stuff that's in yellow right here. Now, there is bedrock at depth, right? But it's it's it, the city is actually sitting on top of very soft lake sediments. So what happens was that when there was an earthquake near Mexico City, a lot of the places that had bedrock exposed at the surface were fine. However, once those waves hit those sediments sitting beneath the city, it really amplified those shaking waves. And um, the destruction in Mexico City was unbelievable. So you can kind of see here on the, on the map above, this was Mexico City and there was extreme damage right here just because of the amplification of the waves because of the very loose sediments that started shaking underneath the city. Okay. I want to show you guys, I know that this, the title of the slide gives it away a little bit, but let's compare two earthquakes. Here's my Northridge earthquake on the left that I showed you uh, earlier. It's a magnitude 6.7, Northridge, California, and notice the intensity map. It was a 6.7 magnitude, and people were reporting that the, it was extremely violent to extreme shaking that they felt associated with that. Now let's compare that. Here is an earthquake in Seattle, Washington. It was a 6.8 earthquake, very, very similar in terms of the amount of energy released, right? The uh, magnitudes are almost identical, but notice the intensity. People were reporting maybe, you know, sixes, sixes to sevens, nothing associated with like the nines, tens, and elevens that were reported for the Northridge, California. So if both earthquakes had similar magnitude, why do you think they had very different intensities? Specifically, why do you think that the Northridge, California one was actually stronger? We did just talk about uh, how sediments can amplify waves. And so if you're thinking that maybe it's because Seattle, Washington has a lot more sediment underneath it, well, that's a really good thought, but then Seattle should have actually had higher intensities, right? So that doesn't work. Instead, this has to do with not just the magnitude or the sediments, this has to do with, as the slide is titled, the depth of focus. What do I mean by that? This earthquake here was only 18 kilometers below Northridge, California, right? So if you can imagine right here's the surface, this was 18 kilometers down, and then the energy waves propagated up to the surface. The Seattle, Washington earthquake was 52 kilometers down. So if you wanna put Seattle, Washington here, right, the depth of focus might've been way down here. And so as the energy waves are trying to reach the surface, right, they're gonna dissipate quite a bit before they get up to the surface. And so it actually has to do with same magnitude, right, same amount of energy released, but the Seattle earthquake was much, much deeper. And so by the time those energy waves reached the surface, they had been um, kind of dampened by all the rock they had to go through before they hit the surface. The Northridge, California earthquake at 18 kilometers depth is actually relatively shallow. So there wasn't a whole lot of rock above those, um, the, the focus of that earthquake to dampen any of the, um, any of the earthquake waves before the devastation was translated to the surface. So, okay, so hopefully this kind of makes sense too. Remember, we go all the way back to what we talked about at the beginning about the stick slip cycle that we can have rocks, right? And we can, we can have rocks that are under no stress. And if we add just a little bit of stress to those rocks, right? Um, we can start to kind of bend them a little bit. Maybe they're under a little bit of strain but that by, the, by this time, if we let go of the stress, they would probably elastically rebound. But as we keep exerting more and more stress on those rocks and we keep kind of putting them under pressure, you may start to see that before the earthquake, you get things called foreshocks. So you actually might start to get little cracks, right? And little breaks in the, um, in the, the subsurface that is showing that you're about to get an earthquake as the um, pressure continues to where you finally get the earthquake, 
does it make sense that now you've actually ruptured the Earth's surface and rocks that were once under stress are now released? However, you've now moved rocks, right? These guys have moved up and these have moved down. So while there is stress release right here, these rocks might now be under pressure or these rocks might now be under pressure. And so after an earthquake, you can get what are called aftershocks. Because you've moved the rocks, you may have now moved the point of where pressure is being felt and that might create aftershocks, more cracking and more pressure release as the rocks are kind of readjusting after the earthquake. All right. I would like to talk a little bit now, now that we understand kind of the basic principles of how earthquakes form and the kinds of um, damage that they can create, uh, I really want to show you um, some of the hazards and the risks associated with earthquake activity. Um, I think a picture like this kind of really shows you the types of devastation that can happen associated with earthquakes. So I'll show you some, um, some pictures and I'll send you to look at a couple of videos as well um, that actually show you what it's like to be in an earthquake. So there are primary and secondary effects uh, associated with earthquakes. And so the primary effects of an earthquake, the things that happen um, that are uh, directly from movement along the fault, those are things like the ground shaking and the effect on people. So this is the stuff that literally is happening kind of during the earthquake, directly associated with the ground actually moving and shaking. Um, the secondary effects are induced by, they are kind of triggered by the faulting and shaking. And so those can be things like landslides, fires, uh, tsunamis, and we can actually see that the, the, the soil and sediment surface can start to behave like a liquid due to uh, the ground actually moving and behaving like a liquid. So I wanna show you some examples of these primary and secondary effects. I wanna look first at the primary thing. So these are formed by direct fault movement. This is the ground shaking and people literally being moved by the ground movement. Uh, if you have a moment, I would really um, encourage you to check out this short video. This is the Kobe, Japan earthquake in 1995. It was a 6.9. It was a relatively short earthquake, um, but you'll notice that it's a, um, the video I've got linked here really shows you the amount of movement that the two store clerks can feel uh, during this earthquake. Um, in fact, it, you'll notice in the video, there's no sound, but both of the store clerks kind of stop and look out the window. They hear something coming first. And before you know it, they are really being tossed side to side um, just for a couple of short seconds, but it was pretty intense shaking. The image on the right here, you kind of can't really tell. This is actually, this is an elevated highway that has actually just, these are all the pilings that it used to be sitting on and the whole elevated highway has literally just kind of toppled over to the to the side um, just like a tree falling over uh, and then um, thankfully right, there's no cars on it right now but you can actually see that there were vehicles on it and they actually slid off when that um, when that um, elevated highway collapsed so um, yeah I was just out of high school in 1995 and I remember this earthquake it was a pretty massive um, widespread devastation associated with the Kobe earthquake um, remember we talked about too that one of the primary effects of the actual movement on the fault could be ground rupture. So here's in California where you can actually see, right, you see the cracks and the movement here, there's more cracking right here happening. There's a great example of the ground moving associated with that, um, that pressure release that caused the earthquake. Here's another good example in Turkey, right, here's a geologist for scale. Here's the ground rupture. Here's the actual cracks along the surface that are resulting from movement along the fault plane. So these are definitely primary effects associated with earthquake movement. A lot of times too, um, a good way to see earthquake movement is to find straight lines. So right here's the yellow line that was once along the middle part of a highway. And actually you can see that wherever there's a jog, right, wherever there's a bend in that straight line, right, this is where the earthquake movement happens. So you can see that the earthquake moved that, um, that subsurface right there uh, in kind of a, a right lateral sense. 
So ground rupture is another primary, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, another primary effect of earthquakes. Um, and here's a good example of what, what we can do when we look at um, the fault scarp, right? This is this ground surface right over here. This piece used to be attached right up here, but this stuff has all moved down this way. So um, this would be the foot wall block over here. This would be the hanging wall block over here. And so the foot wall block moved up with respect to the hanging wall. So this is a normal fault here. And where this rock used to be attached is now exposed in what we call a fault scarp. So surface waves definitely cause shaking that we can see. You'll see it in that video of the Kobe earthquake where you've got the two store clerks and they are really being tossed side to side, right, by those um, Rayleigh waves. Um, and so the surface waves can cause shaking and that shaking can then trigger uh, different types of, of secondary effects. The, um, they can trigger things like tsunamis, they can trigger things like landslides. So let's kind of think about that stuff too. This is an example of an apartment building where underneath the apartment, you can see all these cars down here, uh, there was parking underneath. And so there was a lot of free air underneath these apartment buildings. And so when the shaking happened, um, the apartment, the weight of the apartment building kind of collapsed on all of those, uh, all those vehicles. Uh, this happens a lot with parking decks. Parking decks uh, usually collapse, especially if there's, um, open air between levels on parking decks. Uh, for an example here, right, here's a parking deck idea that that would actually collapse. Here's the elevated highway idea like we were seeing in Kobe. If the shaking is side to side, right, they'll actually just fall over completely like this. Elevated overpasses like that too will tend to collapse, especially in coastal regions too. What you'll also see is you're going to trigger landslides and that can then send all sorts of stuff into the ocean that way. So these are things that are going to be triggered by the shaking um, and we can see the effects associated with that. <clears throat> Here is with the Northridge earthquake, once again in the top, right, there's an elevated highway. And so where the pilings were, the, the uh, highway was fine, but then all the, the stuff in between the highway supports had collapsed completely. And here's an example of a parking deck um, where you've had the free air just kind of, you know, the whole parking deck has collapsed in on itself um, because of the supports giving way on the edges there. This is one of my favorites, right? This is a library uh, and you can see that the, the side to side shaking has literally removed almost every book from the shelf here. Um, you can imagine the cleanup associated with this one, but yeah, uh, the surface waves, they're causing the shaking there, removing all the books from every shelf in the library. So um, you can imagine too that there is uplift and displacement associated with the ground and the surface rupturing. Um, this is 19 feet, right? This is a geologist for scale down here. The displacement along this is 19 feet. That's pretty massive um, to have the ground actually move 19 feet due to one single earthquake event. So you can imagine about the, um, the environmental as well as engineering hazards associated with this. If you have to build buildings that are going to withstand movements of up to, you know, 20 feet or so during uh, shaking, that, that's, that's a pretty um, challenging engineering demand. So I want to show you now some of the things that the shaking can trigger, um, especially some of these secondary effects, uh, tsunamis, liquefaction, landslides, and fires. Um, liquefaction is, a, is a, a way to describe when sediments have um, uh, quite a bit of water in them, if they're not um, being mixed up, if they're, if they're kind of at rest, um, the particles, these kind of long flaky particles here, uh, are actually going to be slightly cohesive. They're going to kind of stick together um, and they aren't going to move. So you can imagine that you've got this little housing development, right, sitting on top of this little kind of, you know, we're calling it a wet, a wet clay layer, <clears throat> excuse me, but um, under normal kind of quiet conditions, that wet clay layer is not a problem because the particles are all touching each other and they have a sense of cohesion. They're kind of sticking together. 
However, if you add shaking and add an earthquake to this, what tends to happen is the vibration of the waves going through that wet clay disrupts all of the clay particles to where they're no longer touching each other. Once they're disrupted and they're not touching each other, they don't have that cohesion anymore. And so they kind of start to behave more like a fluid because they're chaotically arranged. They're not able to kind of stick together anymore. And what you'll get is a lot of, of uh, faulting and slumping and you can really disrupt the Earth's surface. Uh, so much so that it literally will look like what was once a flat surface has now been completely folded back on itself. I'll show you a picture here. Here's a ground surface that has been liquefied during an earthquake. And you can imagine, right, that this house certainly didn't look like that, but look at the, the ground surface has just been completely kind of rolled and folded over itself like this because of liquefaction during the earthquake shaking. Here's another sense of liquefaction here too, right? This is this is pretty intense. This is the whole ground surface has literally been heaved up and over, almost looking like, you know, kind of just, uh, you know, almost behaving plastically like taffy. But this is because during the shaking, there was a lot of water at depth and the energy waves coming through that kind of um, uh, water saturated subsurface made it behave uh, like a kind of just like an elastic band. So liquefaction is a type of secondary effect. Landslides can also be a type of secondary effect of earthquakes. Um, if you can shake the ground surface and you can kind of release a whole bunch of material from the side of a, of a slope, you can send all that downhill. And so landslides are actually a very big hazard associated with earthquakes. In fact, uh, we learned a little bit too about how Mount St. Helens the whole eruption was actually triggered by an earthquake that removed a landslide from the side of the volcano, which then allowed the volcanic eruption to blast out the side of Mount St. Helens. You can also have fires. I showed you that picture of the, um, the fire earlier with the Northridge earthquake, and here's another one. You can um, create uh, breaks in piping for um, natural gas or propane or things like that. And if that gets ignited, um, fires can be a huge secondary effect from earthquakes. In fact, in 1906, the um, earthquake in San Francisco, the earthquake was, was a pretty large earthquake and relatively uh, short-lived, but the, the, the major damage to the city of San Francisco was due to the fires that sparked um, and that couldn't be put out for several days. <clears throat> One of the um, most devastating secondary effects of earthquakes are tsunamis. Um, so let's define a tsunami really quickly. Um, let's remind ourselves that uh, we don't ever want to call a tsunami a tidal wave. Um, tsunamis don't actually have anything to do with tides. Um, instead, a tsunami is what we would call a seismic sea wave, and the seismic part means generated by earth movements. So the seismic part says that something under the ground has moved, and in doing that, it has created a very large ocean wave. So ocean water is displaced either during an earthquake or maybe during an um, underwater landslide, something like that. And it creates a disruption in the water column above it that can create a huge wave. Now, the other thing about tsunamis, when they make the news, they are usually, you know, tens of meters tall, traveling at, you know, hundreds of miles per hour, um, and they're causing significant devastation. Not all tsunamis need to be huge, and not all tsunamis, of course, need to be um, very fast or highly destructive. Really, a tsunami is any seismic sea wave that's generated by movement of the seafloor. Um, it just so happens, though, that the ones that make the news, of course, are the ones that are very fast and um, very large. So just keep that in mind that any sea wave that's generated by seismic activity is technically a tsunami. Tsunamis form just by, you know, we were just talking about by movement uh, of the seafloor. So you can either have this is a normal fault up here, right? Here's a normal fault 
this would be a reverse fault, but essentially we have movement along the sea floor, and you can imagine that would probably happen during an earthquake. One thing that happens with um, seismic sea waves like this, right when the actual uh, earthquake happens, what tends to happen to the ocean first is that the ocean recedes from the coastline. And this is really important. This is um, something that they teach folks who live in tsunami prone areas is that if you see the ocean recede, meaning that the ocean actually goes way back out into the uh, into the sea, that is usually the sign that a tsunami will be coming back in very quickly. You can imagine that here in this example, if you have a uh, normal fault, you've actually created space, right? Right in here because this block has moved down. So the ocean water rushes into the space that's created. So you're pulling water off the coast here to fill in the hole. What eventually then happens is, is that that water sloshes out and then comes rushing back up the coastline. Same idea on this side with the reverse fault situation. If this block is thrust upwards, it's gonna push seawater out here towards the ocean. So you'll see the ocean recede and then what will happen eventually is that water will slosh back out and run up the coastline. So uh, one of the um, signs of an impending tsunami is if, if the ocean starts to recede more so than it normally would during regular tidal activity. Um, in 2004, uh, this was the, the day after Christmas tsunami that was, um, that was absolutely amazingly devastating. Um, you can look at the propagation map here, right? This is from NOAA. Uh, it was triggered from an earthquake here in Indonesia. <clears throat> and this is actually showing you the maximum amplitude in centimeters of the tsunami wave that was generated. So those tsunami waves were actually felt and actually even caused two fatalities in Kenya way over on the eastern side of Africa. Um, and here is the arrival time of the tsunami wave in seconds. It actually took um, only about six hours for it to actually get over to the middle part of the Indian Ocean, uh, and then about maybe 15 or 16 hours before it got over to the African continent. So um, uh, quick moving, certainly, and, uh, and definitely very large. Uh, I do have a YouTube video link here that is about this tsunami. Um, I will warn you there are some um, some pretty tough things to watch in that video, but um, but it does show you not only um, the power of some of these, but how they really can just kind of pop up out of nowhere. People are literally sitting on the beach in Indonesia, not knowing that pretty much anything is going to happen. And then all of a sudden this wave comes in and the wave is not huge. It's not a towering, you know, 30 meter tall wave or anything like that. The problem is, is that the wave comes in, but it just keeps coming. The surge of water behind it just keeps coming and people can't get out of the way fast enough. So you can imagine that because of that surge, because of that amount of water that's rushing in, right, um, there is an amazing power associated with these tsunamis. I mean, you can see this is a huge ferry boat that has just been lifted up as if it's a child's toy, right, and just kind of plopped down on top of the ferry building. Uh, these are all vehicles over here um, that have just been tossed around like they're nothing um, just because of the, the waves coming through the car lots associated with Japan. So um, huge amounts of power associated with these waves here. But the, again, they don't always have to be, but they are at times um, very large and very destructive. Here again is uh, some of the specifics about that day after Christmas tsunami. The earthquake, uh, to use it as a case study, the earthquake was a magnitude 9.1-ish. Um, and it actually lasted pretty darn long, uh, 10 minutes is an earthquake. Set your watch as we're doing the, the rest of this PowerPoint. Um, 10 minutes is a very long time when you're being um, uh, shaken up and tossed around and wondering whether they're going to be um, more aftershocks or when is it going to stop. Usually earthquakes are only a couple of seconds. Um, and it actually triggered other earthquakes as far away as Alaska. This one did trigger a tsunami and the maximum wave height that is reported uh, on a couple of different um, uh, scientific websites was about 30 meters. So that's, you know, up, upwards of maybe 90 feet were some of the biggest waves associated with this. 
um, this is a tectonic map of the region. So the earthquake was actually located right around here. Um, and so this is Indonesia in this region. And a 9.1 earthquake is, is pretty darn big. Um, and the reason why it was so big uh, is this is a, a region that is very prone to earthquakes. This is a subduction zone right in here. And so this oceanic plate is subducting underneath this continental plate right here. Uh, and it was a relatively shallow uh, earthquake, but very large magnitude. So the shaking was pretty intense. <clears throat> a lot of before and after pictures. Here's uh, Sri Lanka. Um, and this was actually, here's the before picture. Uh, here's the during picture. And this is the important part. Remember I said that a lot of times the ocean recedes before the tsunami comes back in. So the ocean is actually kind of heading back out into the sea right now which means that there's a pile, huge buildup of water back here that will eventually surge back up on land uh, and actually cause the tsunami dam uh, damage. Here's another before picture. And then that's what happened afterwards. What you'll notice is that all of the stuff that was once on the land surface has now been completely uh, stripped away and brought back out into the ocean. So places where you can see where there were fields or where there were houses or whatever else, the vegetation is gone, the houses, all the building material, everything has been removed first by the rush of the wave in. And then as the water finally recedes back out, of course, all of that material is taken back out to sea. This is all the same, uh, the same earthquake and the same tsunami. This is in Indonesia as well. Here's the before picture up top. Here's the after. Uh, and all those white dots right there, that's all building material from homes that have been destroyed uh, during the tsunami. So tsunamis are, are uh, they can be, I shouldn't say they're not always, but they certainly can be devastating, but it's not like, uh, you know, oh, there's nothing we can do about it. There's hope is certainly not lost. There are tsunami warning systems that we do have, especially in the Pacific Ocean. Now, the reason why, of course, they're in the Pacific, as you remember, there's a huge plate boundary right along here. And so um, in, in almost all, there's transform motion here, there's subduction here, subduction here, subduction here. So this is an active plate boundary. And wherever we have active plate boundaries, of course, there's going to be uh, fault movement and earthquakes. So what they've done is set up a, uh, a buoy system. Um, they've actually set up seismograph stations, right? Uh, all throughout the Pacific Rim, right out in here. And uh, they've also got tide gauges out in the oceans here to record uh, changes in the elevation of the, the sea surface. And so they can actually see if there is an earthquake somewhere in the Pacific Basin, how long will it take before it reaches uh, elsewhere in the Pacific? The way that you read this map is, for example, if you have a earthquake generated here in Hawaii, it will take you know, five hours to reach here right along the coast of the United States. And so if there's a buoy here near Hawaii that registers that a tsunami has been generated there, you can then relate and say to um, the west coast of the US, you now have five hours until that tsunami hits you. Alternatively, right, if you're over here and there's a large earthquake popped off in Chile or something like that, you can tell Hawaii you have 14 hours to prepare for the tsunami coming this way. <clears throat> so there's kind of this interplay between hazards and risks, um, and I think we use the terms pretty interchangeably, even though they are slightly different. We say earthquake hazards, right? The hazard is the probability that something is going to happen within um, a particular period of time of a certain magnitude. One of the biggest things that people are talking about right now is what is the um, what's the likelihood, what's the probability that California is going to have a very large earthquake in the next, say, 10 years. So that's a big issue associated with um, hazards, right? What's the probability that there's going to be a magnitude, say, 9 or 10 earthquake uh, in California in the next 10 years. So that would be a hazard prediction there. Now risk is slightly different. The risk is the associated damage, the loss of life or property associated with that hazard. 
So we use these interchangeably, even though they actually do have very different meanings. The hazard is the thing uh, that could happen. The risk associated is that is what is the consequent damage or what's the, the loss of life. So what is the risk that you may see, you know, a thousand people, um, you know, displaced from an earthquake or a tsunami? And the reason why this is important is because we can actually map uh, earthquake hazards. So if you look at the map here that the U.S. Um, Geologic Survey has made of uh, the continental U.S., and then they've also actually added, here's Alaska, and then here's Hawaii. Oops, it's supposed to be an H. So there's Hawaii, and you'll notice that the highest, the kind of the, the red and pink colors are showing areas where there are the highest hazards, the highest probability, right, that there will be a very large earthquake. If you're, um, if you're good at your geography, you'll remember that, of course, the stuff out here, right, California is really high because there's that active boundary right there. There's that transform boundary of the San Andreas Fault. Alaska has a subduction zone that runs right through here. So, of course, another active boundary. Hawaii, the big island of Hawaii, sits on a hot spot. So the volcanoes there help to trigger um, earthquakes. This is that New Madrid seismic zone that we were talking about, right, which is the essentially the Mississippi River Valley coming through here. That's an old fault. There's Charleston. We're still not quite sure what's going on and why Charleston has a hot spot there. Um, and the other one that people tend to identify here, this is the Yellowstone hotspot. So uh, there's a hot spot sitting underneath the Yellowstone area, and that tends to trigger uh, some earthquakes as well. If we look at the world map, right, the one down here, we can obviously see, too, that there's that active plate boundary there on the western coast. Um, there's plate boundaries through here as well. And then there's that subduction zone coming across. So a lot of these seem to make a lot of sense that the hazard maps follow the plate boundaries. Here's the probability of earthquake activity in California. There's a, a, a huge um, consortium right now, the Southern California Earthquake Consortium called SCEC. Um, there's the magnitude of the earthquake that they're predicting and what is essentially the probability or the likelihood that a, uh, an earthquake of certain magnitudes will happen over the next, you know, they've got it here mapped as 30 year earthquake probability. Um, and so, of course, it makes sense that the, the lower the magnitude, the more likely it is that we're going to see it both in northern and southern California. And then as they get into the higher and higher magnitudes, notice that the probability values go down. Are these tried and true absolute values that we will definitely get an earthquake of X, Y or Z magnitude in the next 30 years? Uh, no. Remember, these are probabilities. These are likelihoods. Um, and it is just a prediction. But they're not fat, you know, hard and fast. They're not absolute values. These are just ways that we can predict. So let's talk a little bit about how we can predict earthquakes um, or can we predict earthquakes, especially since they don't seem to be um, very um, cyclic in terms of that they happen every 10 years or anything like that. If we look at a map like this, here's earthquakes since 1900. <clears throat> earthquakes aren't actually increasing. So the number of average earthquakes, um, with the exception of Oklahoma, and I'll show you why in a minute, but the actual earthquake number per year, per you know decade or whatever, is not actually increasing. So there really doesn't seem to be any sort of cycle to the number of earthquakes that we're seeing worldwide. So if they're not cyclic, how can we predict whether an earthquake is going to happen in a particular region, and how do we make these probability maps? Well, there are certain activities that we know could increase or influence or even induce. They could actually trigger certain earthquakes. Now, think about what you what you might do to trigger an earthquake. What do you, what do you think that human activity could certainly do or natural activity? I have a couple things that I thought of here. Um, one of the things that we tend to do is uh, loading of the Earth's crust. So, for example, if we make uh, a reservoir, if we put up a dam, and behind that dam, we create a reservoir that has a ton of water. Well, the land surface underneath that water is now going to be under a lot more stress than it's used to. So, of course, uh, rocks are going to shift and you might trigger earthquakes that way. Waste disposal is a big issue. A lot of times we're digging wells to inject wastewater um, and that 
that water or that gas that we're injecting into the subsurface can actually help faults move and slip. And so that can trigger earthquake movements. And of course, too, nuclear explosions, nuclear testing, uh, any sort of you know dynamite, road construction, whatever else, that can certainly, um, you know, it, it can be a good thing in some ways because it may be able to release a little bit of tectonic strain. Um, and actually that has been proposed that why don't we just find areas, for example, the San Andreas Fault that have the probability of a large earthquake and why don't we just strategically set off uh, a bunch of small explosions along that fault to release the energy where we think it is building up? Um, so we can actually trigger uh, earthquakes using certain types of either nuclear explosions or other types of explosions. But um, again, hard to know if that's a good um, tool for uh, mediation of earthquakes because you don't really know where that <clears throat> explosion uh, is going to release the stress, but then also put other rocks under their own stress. Here's what I was talking about earlier about Oklahoma, and I and that there's, you know, we say that generally speaking, the number of earthquakes isn't increasing over time, except except in Oklahoma. And you'll notice that like very, very, very few earthquakes in Oklahoma prior to 2009, and then whoop, all of a sudden this massive increase in the number of, now they're relatively small. I mean, look at the magnitudes, they're very small here. Um, but we would normally not expect Oklahoma to be at a high risk for earthquakes, right? It's not near the Tennessee, the uh, New Madrid seismic zone. It is, uh, it's not near a plate boundary. But if you notice, right, all these little red dots here, all these little red dots are because now geologists are fracking they're using hydrologic fracking in um, in the area to get out oil and gas. And what they're doing is that after they get all of their waste product, they are injecting. Look at Oklahoma injection wells. All those red dots are injection wells. They're injecting the wastewater into the subsurface. And by injecting that wastewater from the hydrologic fracking into the subsurface, it is creating slip along very small faults and it's increasing the number of small earthquakes happening in Oklahoma. Um, becoming a big problem actually because they're, they're seeing a lot of um, associated problems with the subsurface moving and the ground surface moving associated with this. So um, great that they're using the, um, the hydrologic fracking to get some resource that they need out of the ground, but they're seeing a major problem associated with the earthquakes that are completely human induced from the waste injection wells um, in a place that normally would not have any sort of uh, worry about having um, uh, earthquake activity. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about too is, is it possible to predict earthquakes? What would you look for? Um, the answer is yes. There are plenty of things that you can look for to try to say an earthquake is likely to happen um, and and uh, you know it's this you know it, it's it's this likelihood that it will happen in days months whatever so what are we going to look for okay one thing that we'll look for is that the ground surface can actually start to move right remember that um, the whole stick slip idea that um, before a uh, fault actually slips and moves it may start to build pressure to where the rocks around it will start to bend. So if we can see that rocks that are in an area that is prone to faulting are starting to bend, you might notice that there's tectonic uplift and doming shortly before the rocks actually break and you get the earthquake event. So certainly we can see pre-seismic, right, before the earthquake, that's the pre seismic there's the equate right there's the earthquake deformation in the ground surface so keeping an eye on whether the surface is starting to deform or not can tell us about an impending earthquake we also can look for the emission of things like radon gases so water and rock interactions can lead to the release of radon gas and if you monitor radon gas emissions and you see that radon gas increases the increase of radon gas detection can tell you that there might be an impending earthquake. The reason for that is if you're measuring radon gas, the more the rocks crack and start to break, 
the more fluids can get in and interact with the rock and you create more radon. So as the increase in radon gas goes up, you can say that there's the increased likelihood that an earthquake uh, should be coming soon. We can also look for things called seismic gaps. Um, a lot of geoscientists now are suggesting that maybe seismic gaps aren't all that helpful, but um, these are places where along a fault, stress has not been released for a long time. Um, so that's a big, that's a big kind of, you know, um, idea that if you look along a fault, so what they're showing here is imagine that this is like, you know, this is the San Andreas fault from one side to the other, and uh, you're looking kind of down the length. So uh, this would be A to A prime. Imagine you would do A to A prime this way, right? So here's the length of the fault and here's the length of the fault. What you would look for is an area that hasn't had a lot of earthquakes recently. You would call that a seismic gap. This is a place where according to, right, if all these little dots are earthquakes that have happened recently, this is a place where stress is still building up and it hasn't been released in a long time. So if you were going to guess where there is a lot of stress buildup and where there should be potentially an earthquake happening, you would want to look for a seismic gap, right? Energy is building up there and it definitely needs to be released. Um, I used to show this map a lot too, then this is a, usually a, a prior to 2004 seismic map. Um, these are areas that are seismic gaps. And how do I know that this is prior to 2004? Well, notice one of the areas that is still being shown as an area that has not had an earthquake in a long time. Well, there was a seismic gap right there. And remember, this is the Indonesia earthquake the day after Christmas that triggered that huge tsunami. So it was a seismic gap. It was a good potential area for where we could have had a very large earthquake. And then, of course, in 2004, we certainly did. Some other people suggest, and this I, it sounds a little bit funny, but um, some people suggest that animals are actually really tuned into what's going on in the Earth. Um, people have reported very strange behavior. Um, of animals prior to uh, earthquake activity. Um, these are birds at the top here. These are frogs down here at the bottom. But um, a lot of people reported in Indonesia right before the tsunami that all of their cattle um, started to leave the lowlands and all of the cattle were actually moving towards higher ground. So definitely a suggestion there that the cattle might have known that something was coming. Um, a lot of people noticed too that there were um, water levels in their wells had dropped significantly. Um, I know that that's not animal behavior, but at least, you know, there are things that we can certainly look for that tell us, hmm, something's not right. Um, and so maybe there are ways that we can actually monitor this stuff to say, mm, we've got an earthquake coming. So the response to earthquake hazards is, of course, if you are in a, a area that is prone to this, you certainly need to have the proper engineering to um, prevent damage to your uh, construction. Um, here's a beautiful example right here. Here's the, um, this, this is the, the um, oil pipeline um, going through Alaska. And you can actually see that this is the pipeline and the pipeline is actually sitting on rollers. So that's what each of these little, uh, these little tracks are here, that the pipeline is actually, and these are wheels, the pipeline actually sits on rollers so that if there's an earthquake, uh, you can actually then let the, the pipe kind of rattle a little bit and move around and nothing will break and nothing will spill oil uh, in um, the, the, um, the Alaskan wilderness here. Uh, we can also, you know, you can put buildings on rollers. You can actually um, a allow buildings to kind of sway a little bit, uh, which is actually really imp uh, important in areas that are prone to earthquake activity. So there's plenty of preventative measures that we can use during construction. Uh, of course, it's very important to use zoning, right? You don't want to build if there's in certain places that are very prone to um, significant displacement. Uh, and of course, there is earthquake insurance, right? For those that are extremely high risk, I would assume that there's a uh, serious market for this in places like San Francisco and Los Angeles. And the last thing we can do for this too is you can actually set up earthquake warning systems. I know it seems um, a little bit 
crazy to think that these earthquake warning systems can only give you maybe 15 seconds to one minute of heads up before an earthquake hits. But you can imagine what could you do in the in 15 seconds or one minute before you knew an earthquake was coming. And uh, in places like Japan, they practice these 15 second, 30 second drills. Um, and so even if there is an earthquake warning system that is um, based on satellites and whatever else, with just 15 seconds, think of how quickly you could get under your desk or you could get into a doorway or you could get into the bathtub or something like that where uh, if uh, some of the, the structures around you were going to fall, you would be significantly prepared. So definitely, um, definitely getting better at the earthquake warning systems. Uh, and of course, any amount of lead time is certainly going to save lives. Um, so, okay. All right. So we're talking, we, we finished earthquakes and um, definitely important that you guys listen to this one before we do our lab on earthquakes. It will be very helpful. Um, but yeah, hopefully if you have any questions, as always, please feel free to get in touch. Okay. I will see you next time.